Test, test, test. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. If you haven't gotten your coffee already, head back and grab it. Glenn, Glenn will make you anything you can order at Starbucks. He will make you back there. All right, well, welcome, good morning, thanks for coming in, uh, rolling out of your warm houses and coming into uh, this building out in the cold today. We certainly appreciate seeing you and visiting and being together on this Sunday morning here at Harmony Springs. I am Pastor Joel, I am the lead, I jokingly say the lead herder of cats here at Harmony Springs. And so uh, I'm excited to be here with you this morning as well. And we have worked through Christmas and our, can't believe it's already the 21st of January. We're looking ahead towards uh, Lent and Easter coming around the corner here in February. So we're spending a few weeks uh, on some scripture passages found in the Gospel of Luke that have to do with Jesus' interaction with widows, which uh, is going to be interesting and unique and kind of fun for me to do, so hopefully it will be interesting for you and uplifting and meaningful at the same time. So, thank you. Uh, a couple of things to highlight as we get started. First of all, it is helpful, uh, would be helpful to you, uh, har if you go to harmonysprings.org slash online, you can check in and let us know that you were here today. We certainly appreciate that. If you would take a minute to do that, uh, it just takes a few seconds, you put in your name and where you're from and uh, an email if you wish to share it with us, and we'd love to be able to reach out and give you our thanks for joining us and being here today. If you're joining us online, it works the same, even better. You can go to harmonysprings.org slash online and uh, click on Church Connect, and then you can check in, let us know you're here. Church Connect has all kinds of other uh, announcements and events, things coming up that you may want to put on your calendar and be a part of. So uh, you can check that on Sundays when you're here. It's easy to remember, uh, but you can also check it throughout the week as well. Uh, so bookmark that page and visit it often. We'll, we update that as things are progressing. We'll highlight a few things you may want to be uh, put on your calendar at the end of our service after we take communion together. At Harmony Springs, we invite you to come forward at the end of service to receive uh, bread and juice, the communion elements. If you're at home joining us online, online through our live stream, uh, grab some bread and juice from your own home, and uh, you will be able to join us from where you are, and we'll join you where you are. So good morning. Welcome to our friends. I always want to say hello to our friends joining us online. Your faces look like a camera to us right now, but we do know you're here and uh, appreciate you joining us. All right. I want to start this morning with singing, so let's warm up our voices. Will you stand and join in singing? I love divine, I'll love excelling. Will you join me? Jesus, thou art all compassion. 
Take a deep breath and have a seat. <laughs> Children, if you want to come up here and spend a minute with me, come on down. Good morning. Well, let's get this out of the way. Did you guys all have snow days this week? Yes. How was that? Yeah. Snow day on Wednesday. Snow day, cold days. Yeah, it's that time of year, isn't it? Well, in church today, we are talking about the theme that we're talking about. It's called gifts to live on. And here's my question for you to get us started thinking about that. What do we need to live? Mm, what do you think? All right. We got some answers. We'll start over here and go down. Clothing. Clothing, that's good. Yeah. Who else? Kason? Chicken. What? Chicken? Yeah, food, right? Javon? A father and a mom and dad. Oh, yeah, that helps for sure. Landon? Animal. Animal? Is that what you said? Animal. Animals? Yeah. All right, one last one, Casey. Chicken. A chicken again? <laughs> well, when we're talking about how we live or how we survive, it's easy to name things that, are, that we can touch or eat. Like, we always say food, right? Whether you like chicken or some other kind of food. Uh, it takes food to eat. What else, what else to keep our bodies nourished and alive? Do you drink water? Water, you got to have some form of that, right? Yeah. What about, are there other things that we need to survive or to live that aren't things we can touch, things that maybe we feel? What do you think? This is a little harder to answer. Oxygen, yes, that's good. It's invisible. Yeah, Mr. Kaysen, what? You want to use this? Chicken. Chicken, yep. <laughs> Javon, things that we can't touch, but we need to live. We can't touch clouds. Clouds, yeah. And we yeah. can't fly. We can't fly like superheroes, but we can't touch the dog There you go, yeah. Yeah, we got to have some, I know your answer already. How about Aislinn? Aislinn hasn't talked yet. Do you want to tell us something? Not touch the sun. We can't touch the sun, but we do need it. That's right. Well, how about this? Let me tell you this. There are things that God can give us and that other people give us, boys. How about love? It'd be hard to live without other people loving you and God loving us, right? Yeah. Anything else? Chicken. The smile on your face tells me you're going to say chicken. <laughs> what? Nope. <laughs> Got it. All right. Well, we need all those things, but we also need people to love us, and we need to, it's good for us to know that God loves us and cares about us. That's how we can really live, Jesus tells us, right? Yep. Okay. All right. Let me say a prayer for you before you go back to class and do some more learning today. Can I say a prayer? Yeah. All right. Loving God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your love so that we can live more fully. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> oh. I admire you, Pastor Joel. It takes a lot of strength to get down there. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the toughest audience right there. We're grateful to be here today and uh, to turn our thoughts towards uh, the love of God and, and gratitude that we're here today, uh, even though the week that we've had and the weather. So uh, let, us, let us pray. Lord, as the children gather, 
Uh, and as they gather up front here and to the back, as they continue to learn, hopefully they're seeing and hearing all about love from us to them and from them to us, and especially your love, gracious God, surrounding them in everything they do and everywhere they go and in their thoughts. As we hear them talk of things that they cannot touch and even lifting up touching hearts. We thank you, God, that you are indeed with us as we bow this moment towards your holiness. We'd ask that you, as the psalmist would say, create in us clean hearts. And in this day and every day, renew right spirits within us as we pray for the world, as we'd ask for courage to do justice, as we had asked for mercy to walk humbly, as we would seek your will and way all the days of our lives. As we hear again the psalmist saying, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. As we submit to your loving kindness, O gracious God, help us to be a prayerful people as we'd ask for an end to all violence in the home, in the country, and in the world, and into wars. We ask for more peace within our own hearts and peace in the world. And we know that peace begins with love. And we'd ask that that love would, Lord, infiltrate justice everywhere. That justice would be among your people and discrimination and racism and things that would hurt another would cease. We love you, holy God, and we continue to praise you, all love enduring. We'd ask this day that you help us to go forward each step, knowing that you have plans for our lives, each one of us a good work to do. And loving God, as we remember what you have done for us, help us, Lord, this day, again and every day, to fill our lives with thoughts of your loving kindness as we seek your will and way and pray the word you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship, we do pray for Pastor Joel as he brings the message and for his family today. We ask uh, as we pr- listen to the words of Luke 7, 11 through 17, that we hear the word of God. The following day, he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples and large crowd went with him. When he came near the gate of the city, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the coffin, and those who carried it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, arise. He who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he gave him to his mother. Fear came on everyone, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. The rumor of him went throughout all Judea, and the surrounding region. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Over the next few weeks, we are going to read stories from the New Testament, mostly from the Gospel of Luke, that have to do with Jesus' interaction with widows. Uh, This was a new one for me, and it came from, I want to give you a little background or context, I guess, here this morning as we get started on this Sunday series, but uh, a few, a couple months ago, uh, we here at Harmony Springs are part of a larger 
covenant network of congregations, we'd like to call ourselves. Uh, we cooperate together uh, in a denomination known as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, and part of our the benefit to cooperating, denom denominationalism often gets a bad rap because... Uh, for a number of reasons that we don't need to go into today. But uh, <clears throat> one of the benefits, though, to denominationalism or individual independent churches working together uh, is that we can do more together than we can alone, both as individuals, we know that in church, and as churches and congregations in towns and cities and villages throughout the United States and Canada and beyond. Uh, so for us in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, when uh, the world wars were happening, this was a long time ago, right? Uh, we decided to start taking up collections to uh, give relief, world relief, right? Uh, and we called it, I think initially it was one Sunday. We called it uh, a Sunday of compassion. And then it expanded from there and became what is now today known as, uh, in our denomination, week of compassion. I've had a hard time uh, when I first became a disciple of Christ. It took me a while to try to figure that out because it's a weird name for essentially what is a humanitarian relief arm of our churches. So uh, we raise money together, we pull it and give it to the people who coordinate those efforts and uh, the people who are employed by Week of Compassion on a denomination or general church level. Uh, when disasters happen, uh, they are networked with other organizations that are on the ground and then find ways uh, to be of service and of help to them in the best way possible. So this uh, this year, a couple of months ago, as I alluded to, I got an email from Debbie McDonald uh, that was reminding me that this year is the 80th anniversary of that organization, Week of Compassion. And so uh, as a part of that 80th anniversary, they have put together uh, this focus for us as churches to talk about, and I think they intended for us to just talk about it on one Sunday in February, but I was so intrigued with their uh, the choice of scripture and story that they focused on and the conclusions they drawed from it that I thought, uh, let's expand that and do it for a number of weeks. So the story they chose is a more probably a more famous one than we read today having to do with the widow, uh, the story of the widow's might, uh, where a widow, everybody's taking a collection at the church, right? And a widow pulls out a couple of small coins, which is probably all she has, and put it in the offering plate. And uh, Jesus draws attention to her and says, she's give, look at what she's giving, how generous she is uh, compared to all the rest of us, is sort of the subcontext, the, or the subtext. Uh, all the rest of us who often give we keep most of it, and we give some of it, and she gave all, right? So uh, then I started thinking uh, that, of course, is found also in the Gospel of Luke, and as I was researching that story, I realized that Luke liked to tell stories about Jesus' interaction with widows. And then if you're following my logic and train of thought, I thought, why would Luke do that? Why would Luke point out or tell stories about widows when it came to the first century and Jesus' interaction with them? And uh, I think that's a good question for us to ask because, as uh, the gospel writer of John tells us, uh, probably Jesus had more, did more, and said more than we even have captured in the New Testament. And so, the stories that do get included in the gospel, especially as we are focused on the gospel of Luke, were put there for a reason. Uh, and as we look into who widows were, their place in the first century Jewish culture, uh, we can draw some meaning and insight into why Luke would have included these stories and why Jesus made a point to highlight who widows were in the community of which he was a part. So, simply put, uh, the historical context is this. Widows were the most vulnerable. They were uh, at the bottom of the pile when it came to status 
and standing in the first century Jewish culture. They were often in need of being taken care of. The most, I keep coming back to that, they were the most <laughs> vulnerable. In our modern day, I, I was thinking about this in my own life, probably the times where I have felt vulnerable have been very few and far between. One story, and I haven't told you this story for a while, so I'm, uh, you're going to be excited to hear it again, right? Uh, <clears throat> you've heard different angles on this story, but uh, I've told you this uh, from time to time. My wife, Emily, and I lived in Maine for about a year, and uh, it was back in the day where we all had uh, Garmin's and GPS's instead of using our phones. Do you remember when we had to pay for the GPS through Verizon, the app, when, right? All of that? I'm dating myself now, right? Uh, there was a day, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. So GPS, uh, my wife and I lived in Maine, and on the weekends, we were enjoying traveling to different places in Maine. We would go north to Bar Harbor and uh, even up into Canada, et cetera, et cetera. And one day we were on one of those trips. I've told you some versions of the story before. We were following the GPS, and this still happens today, right? Sometimes, have you ever had this happen where you plug in an address in your GPS and it tells you uh, to make a left-hand turn and you look at the road and you think, that does not look like a road? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, a few times it's happened to me. Uh, and in this particular instance, we were supposed to make a left-hand turn, and it was one of those times where the road did not look like a road, and it turned out to be an old, uh, or I think a used, logging road, but it was mostly rock. Uh, and at first, I think because of my stubbornness, uh, now my wife would say that I barely ever follow the GPS's directions, but then for some reason I decided this was the time to follow the GPS's directions. And uh, I made that turn. Before we knew it, we were going down a uh, rocky road and then crossing streams. I should have, like I, I've said before, I should have known when we were crossing small streams uh, in our little Mazda 5 that uh, we were, that I should stop and turn around, but I carried on, right, my stubbornness. And before we knew it, uh, because the car we were driving was not a four-wheel drive uh, F-150 like they drive in Maine or, you know, those sorts of vehicles, I would have been fine probably with that, but uh, we were crossing a stream and the rocks were getting bigger, and before we knew it, uh, I was stuck, I think, propped up on a rock, and we weren't moving anywhere. I think that was a time where I started feeling vulnerable because I didn't know what to do, right? Sometimes maybe we feel that in that, you feel that, felt that in that sort of sense of vulnerability, like the moment when you need help from somebody else and you don't know who to call or you know who to call but they're not around, right? Uh, and then I remember looking at my cell phone and the signal not being very good. Uh, when all of that collapses, the things we rely on, you start thinking to yourself, uh, do we just build a fire here and this is where we live now? We <laughs> abandon this vehicle, right? All of that. Uh, so we did what we could, right? We grabbed our cell phones and we started hiking back out the trail, this road that we came down. And eventually we walked far enough that we got a cell phone signal and I was able to uh, make some calls and looked up, uh, I figured the right call was to a tow truck company, right? To try to get that vehicle back out. And uh, eventually after a lot of calling and waiting and a lot of mosquito bites, uh, the tow truck came. And then I remember this moment that was like, either we abandoned the car completely or we're going to get rescued and be on with the rest of our weekend. The tow truck driver looked at me and, and said something like, and I'm sure he used some words that I can't repeat in church, but he said, what in the, are you driving down this road in this vehicle for? And then he said, uh, he said I'm not even sure I want to drive down this road and, you know, pick up a tow truck can pretty much go anywhere, right? And he debated, 
And I prayed and thought, God, please let him say that he will come down here and hook up this vehicle and pull us out. I don't know if he saw the look on my face or what, but eventually he said, all right, let's give it a try. And he backed down far enough to where we were and hooked us up and pulled us off of that rock that we were stuck on, enough for us, me, to gain my smarts back again and this time drive back instead of trying to continue on. I'll, I tell you that story, I guess, because it's one moment in my life that popped into my mind where I felt vulnerable. Like, there's only a few people that can help in this moment, and if those people don't show up for me, then we're screwed. In your own life, I guess, I ask and want you or encourage you to think about that for a moment. Maybe it wasn't as car stuck in a stream on a rock situation kind of vulnerable. Maybe it was more unseen vulnerable, like emotional well-being sort of vulnerable. And we need somebody else to talk to, to walk beside us, right? All of that to say, I think the reason Luke included the story, these stories of Jesus' interaction with the widows is because they were, in society, the most vulnerable anyone could find. They needed other people. We know from uh, historians that a woman relied, in, the, in that day, a woman relied on her husband. If a husband was no longer there, passed away like this woman in this story, then the next responsibility would fall on the shoulders of her son or sons if she had them. Luke makes a point to point out that this lady had recently just lost her husband and that this funeral procession was for her one and only son. Not only was she the most vulnerable already in society having lost her husband, but now even her son, who could have supported her and taken care of her for his life, was no longer there to do that. She had experienced vulnerability on multiple levels and loss and sadness and grief, I'm sure, on multiple, multiple levels. And then Jesus, who had recently just done some pretty amazing things and had a whole crew of people following him into town, uh, comes into town at the very moment that this funeral procession is happening. Think funeral procession uh, in New Orleans, etc. People uh, who would have been paid to cry and wail uh, to mark the death of someone. And carrying the dead, because of course there were no hearses, right? Uh, carrying the dead outside the city, which was the Jewish custom. That whole parade of people walking together with that widow, all surrounded by grief and loss and vulnerability. Jesus comes into town with this people, group of people who were excited about what Jesus was doing in the region. And sometimes it's important to look at the things that are said and also the things not said or the things done and not done. Jesus, I think, could have ignored it could have walked on the other side of the street, could have not stopped the entire procession like the gospel writer Luke here points out that he did. All of that could have happened. And as one historian that I was reading this last week uh, points out, Jesus could have passed by the funeral procession on the other side, knowing that he had the power to stop it. But none of his other works if he had done that, none of his other works would have made much difference. If Jesus paid no attention, didn't stop, pay attention to the most vulnerable there, it seems that nothing else Jesus would have done would have mattered very much. It's the same for us, I think, in the church. If religion, if church has nothing to say to the most vulnerable in our society, to the grieving widows, then we can extrapolate from that that 
if the church doesn't care for the most vulnerable, I'm not sure that anything we do really matters. My friends, as I think about that, it makes me think that when we look at what we do together as church, the most important things we do are for those who my friend John in the front row has constantly reminded me of. Uh, the most important things we do are for those who cannot possibly repay us. So things like a couple weeks ago when we collected food to put out in the pantry out here, and we, in so doing, support people's dignity in their most vulnerable moments in life. When we collect hygiene items for families that uh, are struggling to even put food on the table, let alone to buy shampoo and soap and toothpaste, etc. When we do all that, my friends, it may seem like a nice act of charity, but it's more than that. For us in the church, it's the essence of what God calls us to. Jesus modeled it when he interacted with the widows. He modeled it in this story, when he stopped the entire procession and said to her, uh, with compassion, weep not, weep not to that widow. And then he looked at her son and said, get up, rise. In so doing, he restored the small sense of dignity that she had in the world in which she lived. So often, I think, in these stories, we focus on the miracles that Jesus performed. They are nonetheless uh, impressive. But we need to also look at why it was done. Why did Jesus raise her son from the coffin that was being carried? Because he cared about her. So, my friends, I'm left uh, with these questions, I guess. One, for us as individuals, I ask myself, how often do I do things for people who cannot possibly repay me? And if I'm not doing it, then maybe Jesus is telling me, and it's small, compassionate way, it might be time to start. And in church, collectively, corporately, are we working together to do things for the most vulnerable who live among us? And we could start making a list of the people who are ostracized, oppressed, and vulnerable in our society. You know who those people are. And church, I think... We're already on that way, but can we always do more? I think we can. And it turns out those things we do for others are actually the most important things we do. If we don't do it, then I don't think anybody needs to listen to anything else we say. Amen?
Pastor, I was um, listening to the radio this week and heard an interesting story. I think I heard a while back, but I didn't hear it put quite this way. Someone paid over a million dollars for a picture of a potato in 2016. And it was an Irish potato. <laughs> I don't know if that matters. <laughs> okay, so people were wondering why in the world, and I'm listening to the radio like, what? And they said it was because of the photographer being famous. The photographer was Kevin, Kevin Abosh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, a famous photographer that has photographed many uh, pictures around the world, and his, painting, or his pictures go for lots and lots of money. At that point, the highest picture had sold for around $700,000 for a picture. And probably Jim's looking this up right now, right in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he'd pull up a potato for me. But anyway, so over a million dollars for this potato and the commentator on the radio went on to say now think about it folks god created you you are god's workmanship how much more valuable are you when you think of ephesians 2 where it says god has created you and created you for good works as pastor was talking about the good works for us to do we are called in advance by god's will and plan to do them how much more value do we have in a potato? <laughs> On the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner, Christ took a cup and poured it out for his disciples. And as he blessed it, he reminded them, as Christ does us, that as often as we drink of this cup and eat of this bread, we do so in remembrance of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's offer this communion prayer. Our Father, God, and loving friend from beginning to end, we come to this time of communion. We are grateful that your holy word has survived the ages, that we are free to learn your teachings, that we are blessed to be able to lovingly share our thoughts and blessings, and that we have the shelter of this building. At this table, Lord, clear our minds of distractions so we will be mindful of how sacred it is to fulfill your desire for Christians around the world to gather and to share these elements of your son's sacrifice. Certainly the horror of Jesus dying on the cross can only be the extreme opposite of the beautiful gift of eternal life offered us. Here are individual expressions of faith and acceptance as we consume these symbols of your son's broken body with humility and gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. My friends, the table is set and we invite you to come forward and to receive. Would you come?
All right, my friends, a few things we want to highlight for you as we wrap things up today. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Pastor Kim for coordinating our live nativity in December. Today is after service. If you want to stick around, if you have thoughts to share on your experience at the live nativity, things we can tweak or improve for next year. Uh, we want to have a wrap-up meeting with Pastor Kim immediately after. We're just going to jot all those notes down so when uh, next, the end of this year comes, we can bring them back out and remember what we said we wanted to do. 15 or 20 minutes, uh, just come up front. Uh, Pastor Kim will lead that time. I know you all have been waiting to know the date for our Live Nativity 2024. <laughs> Pastor Kim came in today and said, it is, drum roll please. Yep. Tuesday, December 10th, 2024. There you go. Uh, so we have the animals booked again, so we will be able to do that. So uh, stick around for that meeting afterwards. Put Tuesday, December 10th on your calendar. I think, what did we say we were going to try to do? Uh, five to seven or something along those lines uh, on that Tuesday. Very good. Coming up around the corner, believe it or not, uh, Ash Wednesday, the official start of Lent, is Valentine's Day this year. So Wednesday, February 14th is Ash Wednesday. This year we're trying something new and fun. We are going to have a Tuesday, February 13th, Fat Tuesday party here at Harmony Springs. Uh, we're going to do it 100% Mardi Gras style. I have already noticed that y'all are trying out your uh, purple, green, right? Is that the, those are the official colors of Mardi Gras. We will have masks and beads. We will have uh, act food. Uh, we're going to do a southern low country boil uh, that I've heard is being very delicious. So we're going to hit that. Uh, and we have some live music. I'm officially calling it uh, jazz trumpet musician Tommy Lehman and the Terry Fairfax Band. <laughs> <laughs> If you've heard, and I look up Tommy Lehman, uh, he's a friend of Harmony Springs, and uh, he gets around in the Akron area. So if you've not heard him play, uh, it's a real treat. So you will be able to eat all the good food before Ash Wednesday. Traditionally, that's what happens, right? We're supposed to eat uh, all the sweets and the fat and the butter get and get it out of the way so that uh, when Ash Wednesday comes, we get that cross on our foreheads and then... We give things up, I guess, if that's what you do. So either way, we're going to use it as an opportunity to have a good time, to eat some good food, to be together, and listen to some live music. So uh, Tuesday, February 13th from, uh, I think I said that was 5 o'clock also, or 5.30 to 7, 5, 5.30 to 8, I think. I'm getting the times mixed up for different things. So uh, you can pull all of that up, like I said, at the top of the service at uh online at the Church Connect. If you go to that harmonysprings.org slash online, click on Church Connect. Those dates and times are all there uh, for you to be able to add to your calendar. Also then, coming up in February, immediately after that, February 18th, the Women of Harmony are sponsoring a luncheon as a fundraiser uh, for our Harmony Grows Garden CSA project out here. Uh, so put that on your calendar and plan to stick around for that luncheon on February 18th. The 18th is going to be a fun Sunday. Uh, we also have a friend of mine, a colleague who I've not seen in a while, and I'm excited to see him. Uh, Reverend Jack Sullivan is going to come and preach for us. He is the executive director of the Ohio Council of Churches, which is an organization that makes it a point to try to get denominations and churches to work together for the good uh, of all of us, just like we sort of talked about today. So I'm excited to have Jack come and preach, and then we'll stick around and have that luncheon afterwards. For that luncheon, it's a soup luncheon. If you've been wanting to make a big pot of soup and bring it to church and share it with others, this is your opportunity. 
If you have a special soup recipe that everybody tells you is the best they've ever had, this is your opportunity. Uh, talk to Jen Murphy or Debbie McDonald. Uh, they'd love, I'm sure, to have a few people bring their own big pot of soup, whatever that may be. So uh, if you're interested in contributing in that way, you can certainly do so. And then uh, I want to also highlight Ash Wednesday. We often here have had a service where we bestow ashes on that Wednesday evening. This year we're doing something a little different. Pastor Kim and Jennifer and I uh, are going to be out here in the vestibule, and you can just drive through, and we will put a ash cross on your forehead to mark the beginning of Lent. I jokingly saw somebody else publish that because it's also Valentine's Day, we can either put a cross on your forehead or a heart on your forehead, whichever you'd like, it'll be a cross. All right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, our friend Kathy who's, uh, Al Alkire, who sits in the back and has made a few trips to the hospital, she is, uh, she, her oxygen gets low and then she needs to go in. Uh, she's at Mercy Hospital currently, so uh, her daughter Dana and Kathy both would appreciate our prayers for her. Uh, usually she, in the past, thankfully she's had to spend a few days and then they get her straightened out and then she gets to come home. So we're praying for that again. Thanks, Pastor Kim. All right. Well, my friends, thank you for being here today. As I send you out into the cold weather, may we all know the warmth of Christ who cares for us and the most vulnerable around us. And may we go and do the same. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks for being here. Good to see you. See you next week. Blessings. Thank you.